Welcome everyone to Snippet Sports Science, episode 52. Happy New Year to you, Jared. Happy Snippet New Year to you, Chris. Yeah, so we've made it through one year of uh, podcasts. That's a pretty good achievement for us. I didn't, I don't, I don't think I actually believed in us when we started. I, mean, <laughs> I don't think I believed we'd make it to a year. This is, this is pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And we've, we've gone through some different iterations of where we've recorded, how we've recorded. We're currently doing this one on Zoom due to uh, different living arrangements. This is our first distance recorded session, isn't it? Yeah, so hopefully everyone still gets into the audio quality or gets into the podcast and enjoys the content that we give you all. And also thank you to EliteForm.com. Make sure you give them a little look or a little visit or a follow. They're doing some great stuff in the velocity-based training space. So what have you got for us today, Chris? Yeah, talking about velocity-based training, there's a really cool article coming out of New Zealand called Redistributing Load Using Wearable Resistance During Power Clean Training, Which Improves Athletic Performance. And one of the authors here is Adam Story, and you interviewed him in New Zealand, ooh, probably third way through our uh, first year. Yeah, that was a fairly early on episode, wasn't it? And we know that this is a, it's a really great group from AUT, Auckland University of Technology. And I think uh, Sprins is in with these guys. So this is Caleb Mariner, John Cronin, Paul McAdam, and Adam Story. Very sorry, guys, if I pronounced anyone's name wrong. I'm sure I did. So just uh, give us a little bit of a background here, Jared. What's the uh, introduction or the article uh, about? So this is redistributing load using wearable resistance during power clean training improves athletic performance. As an overview, what they've done here is they've taken several well-trained athletes, very, very well-trained athletes in relation to the rest of academic literature, and they've had them do five weeks of training with a, with a body suit. So they're comparing traditional power clean versus redistributing 12% of the mass from the bar onto a wearable suit on the body, similar to weight vests. What we've seen is previously weight, le- weight vests have become very popular as a form of resistance training for athletic performance, it's typically used for more sport-specific sort of movements like jumping and sprinting, because then they can just apply a small amount of extra load and you have a bit of resisted power or speed training. However, what they were interested in doing is see if this would apply to a weightlifting population and as well look at some kinematic and kinetic variables that go along with that to see if there's any improvements in either power, strength, or technique in a power clean. Of particular interest with this method is that when you reduce the barbell load, you're decreasing the loading at the wrist, and this may positively affect the lifter during that catch phase in the power clean. For, so for those of you who are less familiar with power clean, it can be quite difficult on the wrist to catch it. And so by redistributing some of that load from the bar to the body, you are able to decrease some of that loading on the wrist. And that's particularly beneficial for anyone who might have a wrist injury. Every time that I read this, it says, while the power clean is less technically demanding compared to the snatch. I'm going to go on a limb here and say that in my 20 years of s coaching, I think the snatch can be just as easy, if not at times easier than the power clean. I think people get all muddled up on the catch position. They can't time it. Everyone can do a high pull really well. Snatch is easy from the floor to the ceiling in one clean movement. The clean, they get it up. They don't know how to get their arms through. They don't know how to hold it into a front squat position. But that's just me. I think everyone gets yeah just confused by the concept of snatch. That's just a real side point. And that's my own anecdotal 20 years of coaching evidence for you. Yeah, I've never actually heard that perspective before. What I would say when I was weightlifting, the snatch was definitely more difficult for me personally. To be fair, actually, power, power clean and power snatch, in my opinion, are not difficult movements at all. It, the full clean and the full snatch are extremely difficult movements. But if you're just doing you know, a power, a power clean and you're not intending to compete in weightlifting, you know, it's just, you're just moving the bar. And it's not too technically demanding. Mm. And but a good point though about the wrists and so forth. Definitely know that a lot of athletes struggle with the catch on the wrists and and sometimes also just the catching on the collarbone. So, look, irrespective of of my opinion, some very valid points there. And look, as you mentioned earlier, they actually had some well trained athletes in this study. There were sixteen male subjects 
And as you alluded to, you had a normal training group, which had no weights vest. And the other one had 12% of body mass weight resistance group. Both of them pretty much had the same amount of weightlifting experience around five or so years. And their 1RM or their power clean 1RM was greater than or just greater than their body mass as well. Yeah, and so that was the uh, requirement for the inclusion criteria is that they had the power clean equal to their body mass. But the looking at the specific numbers here, they typically weighed about 87 to 94 kilo, and most of them had a 1RM of about 102, 103. So pretty good, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. And especially for a technically advanced lift such as a power clean, definitely. Mm-hmm. What was really cool and actually special about this study is the wearable resistance gear that they actually wore. And it was actually called a Lila Exogen suit. And I've actually seen this suit, and it's pretty cool. So what this was, is it was actually like a Velcro-like nature suit. And it was custom designed, where they have like these teardrop-weighted pieces of material of 50, 100, 200, and 400 gram weight cells that were actually attached on the posterior aspect of the subject. And as you could imagine, when you're doing an Olympic lift, such as a power clean, that you need to keep that anterior part of the body clear of any external or additional weight. So that's where this unit or this wearable resistance suit has a total advantage. And you can actually pull the little weight cells off and redistribute it wherever you want. So you can actually, in more applications around sprinting, you can actually modify it specifically to the athlete you know if you want more weight distal or proximal according to level but that's a that's another um subject so i've seen the suit and it's pretty cool yeah it looks really cool hopefully we can get a free act whatever the term is for copyright free use uh, version of the image that we can put onto the icon for the podcast and just adding on a little bit about the suit and how it was worn they had different weight cells of 50 100 200 and 400 grams on it so you can do different distributions of different amounts on there and the way that they distributed it was about one third of the weight so about four percent of the barbell load to the back the glutes and the hamstrings respectively also important to note here to ensure that equated training volumes and intensities are achieved in the weight resistance scenario the total mass of the external load in other words the combined load of the barbell plus the wearable resistance on the lifter would be equal to that of having the total load on the barbell alone. With respect to the training intervention, it was five weeks long, and they wanted to really determine the effects of training with 12% of body mass of wearable resistance had a performance of the power clean and counter movement jump. The wearable resistance of 12% body mass was actually chosen due to significant changes that have been reported in athletic performance measures with loading of similar magnitudes. And the effects of the 12% body mass wearable resistance were investigated at loads of 50%, 70%, and 90% of the subject's 1RM via high-speed video, force plates, and linear position transducer technology. Very nice comprehensive testing here. So the first thing they did was a familiarization session where they tested their one repetition maximum in the power clean across six different sets based on their previous known power clean 1RM. Uh, following that, they familiarized with the wearable resistance, doing three repetitions at 50%, 60%, and 70% of the subject's one repetition maximum power clean. They then had a 48-hour recovery period, and the subjects completed a pre-testing, which involved two counter-movement jumps and a series of sub-maximal power cleans. This was to determine baseline measures for the counter-movement jump height and technique, as well as barbell velocity, peak ground reaction force, and power output for the power clean. The time and error method was used to calculate the counter movement jump height. It's also important to note here about the technique around power clean testing. So subjects were instructed to pause for one second at the lockout position with knees fully extended to provide a definitive endpoint for the kinematic analysis. And as Jared said actually earlier, subjects completed these three submaximal power cleans at 50 and 70% one arm loads and two reps at 90% one RM loads. One practical repetition at 60 and 80% one RM loads were also included to ensure a progressive increase in loading intensity. Once again, these guys are really smart. And when we go into the training here, well, I'll go into the training now. They actually perform five weeks, three times a week using an undulated periodization methodology here. 
The loadings they used were between 60 to 80% of 1RM. They used between one to three repetitions and also incorporated light, moderate and heavy weeks within this whole five week period. And as I said, th- these guys are really smart people and really practical. So when you look at the study, rather than trying to blow them out of the water with progressive accumulation, they've actually given them respect as athletes and probably given them programs which were more like what we would actually give in the real world if they were athletes. Right. This is, this is one of the few groups, really, in my opinion, that has both excellent academic rigor as well as perfect practicality. It's excellent applied science. Yeah, so true. Totally agree. And so just going into those technique variables real quickly, which were adapted from Winchester and colleagues, they looked at five different technique variables here. The first one was the furthest position to catch, the start position to the catch, the start position to the beginning of the second pull, the second pull position to the forward position, and the vertical displacement from the start. Most of these are sort sort of how much did the how much horizontal displacement was there in the barbell. And, and these are probably your five important factors to note in technique. And when you actually start to delve into the more technical world of Olympic lifting, that, that there's five variables that you know are, are useful to take into consideration. Other things to also note here, they used a force plate to look at ground peak reaction force. And also they used that uh, linear positions transducer to monitor bar velocities. Yeah, so they're really hitting this from every single different dimension. They're looking at technique, speed, power, force, etc. Now that's so, so I don't know. as we see here, as we just said, five weeks of training, three times a week, two different groups using a really thorough yet practical testing and training protocol. What were the main results that they found in this uh, study, Jared? The two biggest results from this study are first we see a likely increase in that counter movement jump height. An effect size of 0.53, moderate effect size, over a five week training period, that's quite good. And we also see a possible increase in that power clean one repetition maximum. That's an effect size of 0.2, which is a small effect size, but again, over five weeks, I'd be pretty happy with uh, improvement in my power clean one repetition maximum of an effect size of 0.2. In addition to the about 9% increase in the counter movement jump height and the 4% increase in the one repetition maximum power clean compared to the traditional resistance training group, which had a slight negative 1% decrease in the counter movement jump and only a 2% increase in the one repetition maximum power clean, the weighted resistance group also increased power output across all the loads with effect sizes ranging from 0.33 to 0.62, about small to medium effect sizes there. Additionally, the weighted resistance group increased as well. The weighted resistance group increased barbell velocity at 90% one repetition maximum for a fairly large effect size at 0.74 at 3.5% improvement compared to the traditional resistance training group which actually had a negative 4% decrease in the barbell velocity at 90% one repetition maximum. Several bar path kinetic variables were also improved at the 70% and 90% one repetition maximum loads for the weighted resistance group. Therefore, the weighted resistance power clean training with the 12% body mass can positively influence power clean ability and counter movement jump performance, as well as improve technique factors. That, that's pretty cool when you think about it, that you're increasing counter movement jump, you're increasing bar velocities, but you're also able to improve technique. Uh, There's a real benefit across the whole board here, and especially for athletes where this exercise is important, but they're not Olympic weight lifters, has great application. Yeah, man, I'd be pumped. Those are great results over a five-week period. And as well, you know, it's, you'd kind of rather have that 12% body mass on you as well because my uh from bench pressing my uh my left wrist occasionally bothers me and so i mean i always appreciate moving a bit of weight off of the bar yeah and when you're actually going through the results there the thing about the increase in bar velocity took me back to the velocity based training podcast that we did where you know you actually can if you can train at greater velocities over a longer period of time 
your end result in one RM is, is typically greater and your performance yeah. outcomes are greater. So you can see how that velocity-based training kind of outcomes can kind of be intertwined into some of these results. Yes. You're, if you're moving the same over, overall load and you're moving faster, well, then you're producing more output, plain and simple. Uh, there is potentially a little bit of consideration as, okay, they've moved some of the load from the bar to the body, and that probably does decrease the overall torque of the system that they have to produce, but they are still moving the same total load. Here we've gone through the results. We can see that the performance parameters have all improved using the wearable resistance. We started to allude a little bit onto the improvements in the technical variables. And as we can all attest to that, if you improve your technique, they're highly correlated to success of the power clean outcome. And in particular, they look at the horizontal displacement from the second pull to the forward most position. And during the 90% 1RM efforts, the wearable resistance group improved this second pull to the forward most position, which in the paper, if you refer to as D times V, through a decrease in rearward displacement compared to the increase in the forward direction in the typical training resistance group. Right. So my understanding of that second pull position to the forward position is when you've pulled the bar up to about your hips. And then you're pulling it through to get it onto your shoulders or onto your clavicle if you don't have any shoulders. Then that sort of that measurement is how much you're swinging the bar forward in that part of the movement. That's right. And the big one here that I actually spoke about is they seem to think that that 12% of body mass of wearable resistance on the subject's body may actually reinforce a movement pattern that requires lifter to maximally extend their hips, knees, and ankles during the second pull by pulling the bar closer to the body as opposed to letting the barbell travel forwards. In other words, you got the resistance on the posterior of the body and you just got to work harder using that posterior chain to actually get full extension. Makes sense. Right. And I think a lot of people don't really understand the weightlifting movements as primarily they're sort of a balance exercise more than anything else. And so it's learning to be as balanced as possible during the pulls and the catch in order to not fall over. Yeah. So what are your takeaways from this, Chris? Based on these findings, training with wearable resistance can improve power clean performance and also counter movement jump. And an outcome of that is improved technique. In this case, the improved lifting technique and increased bar velocity found at that 90% of 1RM would suggest that this has a really good transfer to 1RM performance enabling greater loads to be eventually be lifted to the athlete. From a real practical point of view, if you're having athletes who have a level of technical competency, you can do this to continually improve their lifting technique, which I think is really important, but it also has that ability to continually improve those performance parameters, which we're trying to always do, we're trying to improve power outputs, we're trying to improve counter movement jumps. I think it's pretty clear with that that you know you can choose a very good exercise that's been proven in the strength and conditioning world and just be a little bit smarter on how we can program it for some of our athletes absolutely excellent conclusions excellent study definitely so thank you very much jared thank you chris and thank you listeners for joining us as well and remember to visit us on our socials at snippet science we're on the website snippetscience.com and also remember, if you have time and you're still listening to us, to give us a rating on iTunes. Thanks for your time. Bye.